Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. Before we get started, just a quick thank you for getting Extreme Genes to where it is today. We're on radio stations all over America, and our podcast is growing exponentially. I'm often asked, what can I do to support Extreme Genes? Well, that's easy. Become a part of our Extreme Genes Facebook community and like our page. Share the podcast with your friends. Follow us on Twitter. And most importantly, support our sponsors through links on our website. They're the best in the business. Thanks again. Now let's get on to this week's podcast. Are you digging up the dirt on your dead? Want to find out how? Hear the latest on new family history sources and websites with interesting and fun guests and experts. Find out what other people have been learning about their ancestors. From kings to thieves, inventors to farmers, nothing that's been discovered should surprise us anymore, but it always does. Find out what we mean. Great family history stories and information are on the way now with Extreme Genes, Family History Radio, and ExtremeGenes.com. It's been this way for generations. Dates in the Bible don't quite match the marriage certificate. Uh oh. And welcome back to another mind-blowing edition of Extreme Genes, America's family history show at ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth on the program where we shake your family tree and watch the nuts fall out. Well, it's great to have you, and we've got some great guests this week. Uh, Janet Havorka is back from FamilyChartMasters.com. And not long ago, I was teaching a class, and, and somebody said to me, hey, what do we do, though, if we want to have our stuff over here, and we want to have it over here, and we want to keep our own database, isn't there just one button we could push that puts it everywhere? Well, the, the short answer is, of course, no, but Janet is going to help us to figure out some ways to make it a little bit easier to share the material we get and make sure it gets out there. So that's going to be a great segment coming up in about eight minutes. Then later on in the show from Illinois, we're going to be talking to Deborah Bruns. She has been making some incredible discoveries in her own family. We're going to talk to her about that and what she found out about her grandpa. Always good to know about Grandpa. But right now, let's check in with David Allen Lambert. He is the chief genealogist for the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org. How are you, David? Great. Greetings from Beantown. How are you doing, Fish? You know, last night I was up very late because we painted a room as we're getting ready for family to come in for the holidays. And and so I sat up and did a little research, and I tracked down uh, my first felon in the family, uh, descended from the immigrant ancestor, a third cousin of my dad's. I found his mug shots from San Quentin. Oh, my goodness gracious. Well, hopefully it's the last <laughs> criminal in your family. We're hoping. We're hoping, yeah. <laughs> San Quentin, he was a forger in 1928. Then I found the digitized accounts of his capture and what he was doing. I mean, it was crazy. See, I don't have to go that far back. I just have to look at my grandfather. He was in jail for being a bootlegger during the Great Depression. So. <laughs> These stories yeah, are out there, those... too, and we can get them now. That's true. I haven't found a mugshot of him yet, but I have found his prison records and a variety of articles in the newspaper stating that George Lambert should give up the liquor business. <laughs> 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 so what do we have in our family histoire news this week? Well, in honor of November being the month we celebrate Veterans Day, I wanted to tell you that the oldest American veteran is the soon-to-be 110-year-old Frank Levingston of Lake Charles, Louisiana. Wow. Yeah, this young man joined the Army in 1942 and served right through the end of 45. His memory is sharp. I watched an interview with him online, and it's great to know that he has some close company because Richard Overton, who was thought to be the oldest veteran of World War II as of last, Last year is 109, so he's, he's a little young. Oh, he's just a kid. Well, you know, it's funny. Uh, veterans from the wars lasted a long time. I mean, the last veteran from the Revolutionary War died four years after the Civil War. I mean, you have World War wow. I veterans that were alive right until 2011 when Frank Buckles died. I mean, it's, it's amazing. These guys lived for a very long time, and if you really think about it, my dad was in World War II. I'm sure you had relatives in it as yep. well, and it's like they could be living for the next 25 years if these 90-year-old guys live to be super centenarians. That's right, into the late 2030s. Exactly. And, you know, it's so important to get these stories down. I always People on social media always post a photograph of 
a vet or they thank a vet online, which you know I always try to do around this time of year. But it's so important to get these stories down. Are you aware that the Library of Congress for a while now has had a program to record the stories of veterans? Yes, and it's fabulous. Yes. Oh, it really is, because, you know, everyone thinks Library of Congress has to be Abraham Lincoln or Teddy Roosevelt or Franklin Delano Roosevelt. No, it could be about your dad. And if your dad's still alive and he was a veteran or your mom was a veteran, the Library of Congress has on their website the details to record these stories, capture these images and videos. It's like a time capsule left over from the 20th century for future generations. It's fabulous. Love it. Well, you know, I'm going to go to the other side of the world and talk to you about recent news from Moscow. Remember a few years back, they had found the remains, they were pretty sure, of Tsar Nicholas II and his family? Right, yes. DNA has helped out a great deal. Uh, the end of September, they re-examined the jaw bones of both the Tsar and Empress Alexandra, and I think also a neck bone of hers. They abstracted mitochondrial and Y-DNA from the remains and also matched it up with blood from a shirt that the Tsar was known to have worn. And it's a perfect match. So the Tsar and the five children are now accounted for that were obviously executed during the revolution. Now the jury's basically still out with the Russian Orthodox Church waiting to decide if they want to believe these results. It's amazing. And DNA has so unraveled this mystery. Speaking of that, Harvard University over in Cambridge, across the river from us, has made a remarkable new free database on colonialnorthamerica.library.harvard.edu. You can find over 150,000 color images from the Harvard archives covering from the 1600s right through to the early 1800s from their collection. It's amazing. Ooh, that is fun. There are maps charts, drawings, diaries, letters from presidents and former governors, some really great stuff, but it's searchable by last name or by community. So you can put in a search for your family or where they lived and see if they come up in one of these documents. My tech tip for the week is going to be a real simple solution. Now, when you're trying to illustrate your genealogy, you know, you can look through all your family photos and, oh, you know, you can't go 300 miles to get a picture of that church. Well, wait, the church burned down 50 years ago. Go on the eBay and put in a search for your community. For my hometown, I put in that town in Massachusetts, and I searched for postcards. The old penny postcards that were produced from the early 1900s, yes. sometimes right through the 1960s and 70s, are great for that. I'm sure you've purchased a few in your time uh, doing some genealogy. I absolutely have, and I got a few from my dad's hometown in Bogota, New Jersey. I have a penny postcard taken about 10 years before my father was born, and it's the only known image of the house that he was born in. Wow. Uh, in the corner of the postcard, but I know exactly where he was born in 25. And sure enough, there's a trolley coming around the corner, and uh, there's the building right next to it. So it was the best five bucks I ever spent. Yes. <laughs> so it, it's real simple. You can set up on eBay search terms. So if you're looking for Abington, MA, Abington, Mass, or Abington, Massachusetts, and then just add the word postcard, and it will send you an email anytime that something gets listed. So build your own little town archives from where your family lived. Nice tip. Well, like I say, it helps illustrate your family for really low cost, and the images are out of copyright. So Perfect. That's really even a better part. This week, our free guest user database on AmericanAncestors.org is going to take you a little further south of the border. We have 18th through 20th century Guatemalan records, and this is brought to us courtesy with our joint partnership with FamilySearch.org. And it's just another way that NEHGS in Boston allows you to see that we're far more than what New England in our title is. Exactly. All right. Great stuff, David. Thank you so much for coming on, and we'll talk to you again next week. Talk to you next week, my friend. And coming up next, we're going to talk to Janet Havorka from FamilyChartmasters.com about how to coordinate getting your data out to many different platforms with the least amount of effort that's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Well, Janie's my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night, has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. 
world and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Hi, Genies. It's Fisher. So excited to tell you about our very first Extreme Genes Family History Cruise, September 13th through 18th, 2016. We'll be leaving out of Boston on Royal Caribbean with stops in Bar Harbor, Maine, St. John, New Brunswick, and Halifax, Nova Scotia. On days we're at sea, join me and David Allen Lambert, Chief Genealogist of the New England Historic Genealogical Society and AmericanAncestors.org, for lectures and roundtables on several genealogical topics. See where your patriot ancestors ancestors fought in the revolution or where your loyalist ancestors claimed their new homes for pricing go to our extreme genes facebook page or visit extremegenes.com now is the time to make your reservations because when the cabins are gone they're gone call robin at columbus travel at 1-800-373-3328 extension 1010 and be sure to ask her about our special pre-cruise excursion in boston david and i look forward to seeing you And we are back, Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. I am Fisher, your radio root sleuth. And you know, it is not uncommon when talking to other genealogists to find people who are just saying, wait a minute, I got to upload to Family Search. Oh, and I want to upload to my heritage and to find my past and to ancestry. Oh, and I want to have my own roots magic database. How do I keep these things all coordinated and how do I choreograph it so that I can keep this work at a minimum? And, and boy, that is a real problem. And that's why I've got my good friend Janet Havorka from FamilyChartMasters.com on the phone. Hi, Janet. How are you? Good. How are you? Awesome. I saw you gave an address on this at BYU back over the summer at a family conference there about choreographing all these databases on all these different places that we like to be. And of course, there are advantages to being on all these places because you might hook up with other folks with answers. Absolutely. Absolutely. There's so much out there that it's just a challenge to try to figure out how to get it all organized and keep everything together so that you can figure out what you're doing. <laughs> but that's a good thing. There's so much out there. It's that's right. Great. And you know, you think about it, Family Search, for instance, you can't upload a GEDCOM file, but you can in other places. So there's got to be a way to minimize all this effort to add the same piece of information or major bits of it in, in different spots. How would you suggest going about it? Well, that's why I developed this class that I taught is we're seeing with charts, when we ask people to send us their information, they used to just say, oh, well, I can send you my Roots Magic file or my Path file or, or I can download it from Ancestry or something like that. But over the last two or so years, most people now are saying, well, my mom's side is over in Ancestry and my dad's side's over in Roots Magic or whatever. And, and people are getting a little scattered, and that's why I kind of put this together. I think the key, the biggest key is to find a place to plant your tree, that you have to have one go-to place. And that can be a number of different places, but you have to have one place to plant that tree, and then you can go out and look for other information to bring back to that tree. So, yeah, that makes sense. So the biggest thing is pick one place. 
and then the key to that is to decide, after you figure that out, you want to decide whether to keep it online or offline. And Now, wait, let's that. stop right there for a minute. Why would anybody want to do it offline? Well, anything that's in software is actually on your computer rather than on a database. Out on the right, but why would so, they want to do it offline instead of having it online where others might find it and share other information? Well, there's some good reasons to do it offline. First of all, a lot of the softwares have better reports. You can keep track of it. They're also usually faster. In fact, one of my good hints in this thing is to have two machines or maybe two screens hooked up to one machine where you can have one that's out browsing the net but then bringing things that you find into your software. Uh, most of them can sync with different databases, too. So my heritage will sync automatically with Family Tree Builder. Ancestry will sync automatically with Family Tree Maker. Legacy Ancestral Quest and Roots Magic will all sync with Family Search. Roots Magic will also go out and search the documents in my heritage. They can give you a little more crossover, and also you own it. You have it, and you can add information that's private. You can add all sorts of things, and, and you don't need to put that out on the databases if you're worried about any kind of privacy or anything like that. And most privacy issues, of course, have to do with the living. Yes, absolutely right. So if you've got things that you want to keep track of but that maybe you don't want out there, just making sure that you're safe, then you would want to keep them on your own machine. But again, a lot of the reasons to have it on your own machine or on a piece of software is to have your own copy. You can do it if you're in the car or whatever. There's some good reasons to do that. Well, and that's a great point, too, about the various uh, pieces of software that can coordinate with the various websites. You might be able to just right. handle it from one place to there. That's great. Right. I love that. Right. That's a great tip to but, start with. Right. But usually you're going to use kind of a combination. You're going to maybe use it on the software because there are benefits to having it out on a database, too, right? You've got oh, yeah. Collaboration. You've got the instant backup. You don't have to worry about a computer going bad. And then the hints. The software sometimes will have hints as well, depending on which software you pick. But there's some good reasons to have it out online. So you can pick a combination, but you still just need to have one place where the real updated version is in one place. One software website combination like Ancestry Family Tree Maker or Family Search Roots Magic. Do you ever see the day, Janet, where all the different software makers coordinate with all the major databases out there, Family Search My Heritage, uh, Ancestry, and Find My Past? That's a good question for smarter people than me, but I would think because there are commercial entities here and because they have commercial interest in that, I would think they're going to hold their cards closer to their chest. Family Search being a nonprofit has opened that up for other people to work with. And then with the partnerships that they have done with the big databases as well, that has loosened things up a bit. That's from them being nonprofit. Right. One thing to note, though, if you're going to plant your tree in the Family Search database, that database is a little bit different than the others. It's built on a Wikipedia type structure where people can write over top of each other's information. Yes. And so if you're going to plant your tree there, you need to be aware that your brother in law or your niece or whoever can come in and change what you've been doing. And so a lot of people prefer to have it in another place where they can keep a little more control over it, but then interact with Family Search a little more carefully. For example, uh, if you have an LDS account, you can plant your tree over in Ancestry and still interact with Family Search. You can plant your tree in one of the softwares that work with Family Search, and then also use it with Ancestry and Family Tree Maker and things like that. There's there's a lot of ways to kind of correlate it together. Probably more than we can go into here quickly on the radio, but lots of good ideas about how to use the softwares together and the databases together by syncing with the software and then moving that data from the software over into another software that then syncs with other databases as well. Well, that, that's the nice way to go. I was teaching a class once and uh, talking about this very point, and the guy said, well, this is really very inefficient that I can't coordinate everything from one place, and so these are great answers. All right, what else yeah. do you have, Janet? I have two other little hints for you that have set up my research ability, and these are a little bit just side notes that I think would really help. And if, if you already know how to do this, then it's kind of, Oh, big deal, I already knew that. But if you didn't know how to do this, I'm about to blast your world right open. Okay, <laughs> so great. The first one is the first one is when you are in any kind of 
application on Windows, especially, you can grab that top bar and slide it over to the side of your monitor. Grab that top bar, slide it over to the side of your screen, and it'll give you an exact half screen of that application. So a lot of times I'll take my software and slide it over on one side and my browser and slide it over on the other side and then I've got a perfect half screen where you can work on both together. Wow. Um, another quick hint is when you're um, cruising along in your internet browser looking up things, uh, say I do a Google search for something, I go down that list and I right click and instead of just clicking on it and going to that next page, I right click and it gives me a open link in new tab option. And I can go down, say I've got a Google list of seven things I want to look at. If I right click, open link in new tab, right click, open link in new tab, I open up seven new tabs, but I leave that Google list open. And then I can work my way back through those tabs and say, okay, yes, that's my grandpa. No, that one's not. Yes, that is and go through and work through that information. But then when I've closed all those tabs, I'm back to where I started and I can go on to the next several parts of the search that I was using and, and keep working through my search. And that works anywhere. That works on Ancestry, that works on Facebook, sure. that works anywhere. And then the second thing that I found really helpful too is to actually sign into my browser. So Firefox or Google or anything like that, up under settings, you can actually sign in and what that does is it helps share your tabs and your bookmarks and your saved passwords and even your history over onto any other devices that you have. So I've signed into Chrome on my laptop, and I've also signed into Chrome on my iPhone, and I've signed into Chrome on my tablet. And so then if I'm doing something on my laptop and I have to leave and end up you know, waiting in a line at the grocery store or something, I can pull out my iPhone, and I can go in and look at those same tabs that I had open still on my laptop. Nice. And I can just keep going anywhere, wherever I am. So what a great tip. things open across different devices. Well, I think that's too. that's all great advice because it really, at the end of the day, there's no way to take everything and share it with every place. You've got to work on some places and you got to supply information here a little bit, but there are some little tricks and I like them. Yeah. Great ideas, Janet. And then bring it back to your planted tree. Yep. Back to the planted tree and that's, that's the place. I've come to much the same conclusion, but I wish I'd have taken your class a while ago. I had to figure it out for myself. Well, I'm glad you figured it out. Hopefully these ideas will help some other people too. Absolutely. Yeah, one home base and then you work and and spread and share to some of the other places as well. Great yeah. ideas. She's Janet Havorka, FamilyChartmasters.com. Thanks so much for the advice and great ideas, Janet. Great to talk to you. And coming up in five minutes, we're going to be talking to Deborah Bruns. She's in Illinois. She's been working on her family history for 10 years now, and she's found some interesting things particularly about old grandpa. We'll tell you about it coming up in minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. Zap the grandma gap .com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks.
Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style of genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. And welcome back to America's Family History Show, Extreme Genes and ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, the Radio Root Sleuth. And I love it when a listener checks in with a great find from their research and shares it with everybody. Not only the details of the story, but some of the details of how they actually found this information. And on the line with me right now from Montgomery, Illinois, it's Deborah Bruns. Hi, Deb. Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. I'm excited to have you, and I I love it when you reach out and share as you have. And you've been working on a little problem with, what is it, a grandparent? Yeah, (laughs) Uh, my grandfather. He was quite the character. Uh, Now, did you know him? No, you know, I remember seeing him once when I was about five. Okay. And that was it. I just never knew any of that side of my family. How I got started in genealogy is I wanted to know if he was still alive. So I decided, okay, you know, he'd be old now. This was 10 years ago. And he was born in 1915, but I thought, well, there's still a chance. Sure, 10 years ago, maybe. Yeah. So I went into the Social Security Death Index and found out right away he had died. So I thought, gee, you know, I had heard stories about his mother, and I wanted to know what happened to his father. And because I'd always heard, well, the father left the mother with all these kids. There was like nine kids in the family. And I thought, I want to see what happened to the father. So I went in and I found out the father's name was David Seth Carver. And I just went crazy from there. You know, it just, I got the genealogy bug and I went with it. (laughs) And I just kept researching and researching then on my grandfather and found out he had been married four different times. Mm. And, um... His last wife was his brother's widow. (laughs) Well, that's almost biblical, isn't it? (laughs) Well, and and he had uh, two sons with her that my father never knew. He never knew he had two half-brothers. So were you able to get in touch with that side of the family? Oh, definitely, yeah. And it was just, you know, I can't tell you how much fun it all was. I mean, to, you know, discover here I got two half-uncles, both younger than me, we planned this big family reunion back in 2007, and we had a bunch of people there. I mean, it was just, it was awesome. There's no other way to describe it but that. So now every couple of years, we have a big Carver reunion. We're planning one for this coming June, and we just discovered more family that we didn't know about. So they're going to be there. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Now talk about some of the stories you've discovered that have made you go, oh. Well... My grandfather, <laughs> seen all the times that he's been in jail. Um, that would do that. Yeah. <laughs> he had robbed a tavern, him and his brother. So he got caught with that. The thing I don't understand is he liked to drink. Okay, so he robs this tavern, and he takes everything but the booze. He took cigarettes. He took clothes. <laughs> He took the cash register, but he didn't take any booze. I don't wow. understand that. Now, how old was he? Uh, when he did the robbing, he yes. was 33. Oh, okay. 33. Okay, yeah. so he wasn't like a kid who was just going through a phase. No. And then he had, uh, let's see, in 1943, he joined the Army, and he was only in for three months. So I would really like to know what the story is behind <laughs> that one. Usually they insist you stay a little bit longer, <laughs> yeah. especially so, during times of war. I'm kind of thinking that probably was a dishonorable discharge is what I'm thinking. Mm. <laughs> 
Yeah, there's been several characters like him that I've discovered through the family. There was Captain David Carver, who would be my fourth great uncle. He was actually Chicago's first lumber merchant. He came here in 1833 and then moved on to Ottawa County, Michigan. And he ended up, his father ended up dying, so he went back to Ohio and became postmaster of a town called St. Louisville. And he was embezzling money from the government. He got caught doing that. (laughs) So you started this whole thing wanting to find out about your grandfather, and now you've discovered a family tradition. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, right? I guess you could say yes. that. Yes. Okay. Um, the black sheep are pretty interesting in anybody's line, and you're certainly not are. alone with this. Yeah, they really are. He didn't want to go to jail, obviously, Captain David Carver. So he ran off with John C. Fremont on his fourth expedition. Oh. He did come to a terrible end, though. He ended up freezing to death. Ooh. It was out in Colorado. It had something to do with the railroads. They were going to put in railroads. And he was out there exploring, I guess, looking for the best route. And so David wound up freezing to death, uh, obviously in a sudden storm or something like that. Well, you you figure it's November and it's Colorado. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Which leads to another great story, actually, about my Seth Carver, the third Seth Carver. Okay, so what era are we talking and where? He was born in 1801. Okay. And he was born in New Jersey. And the family came to Licking County, Ohio, right around 1812 to 1815. So that's where he spent his years growing up. And then he eventually moved to Illinois. But the thing about him is that he went out in the gold rush and nobody ever heard from him again. Were you able and to track him down? No, you know, I have I've keep hoping I'll find in one of these old newspapers some story about yes. you know, what happened to him. I looked for him for so long and couldn't figure out anything, and then finally I found an article that was written about his grandson, Dr. Charles Carver Ryan, that mentioned that he went out west in the gold rush and the family never heard from him again. Wow. You know, anything. I don't care what little tidbit, anything. (laughs) Yeah, right. You hope to find. Of course, it's, you know, I always say, if you give me enough fuzz on the tail of the cat, I can pull in the whole cat. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you know, just every little bit. I mean, it just adds to the story, and eventually you can put all these pieces together and you come up with something, and that's what happened with Captain David Carver. I mean, I kept getting little tidbits, and finally I was able to piece together most of his life. Now, were you able to find some full stories on his passing and the episode with the Fremont Group? Things that were written, yes. Uh, There were some diaries written by some of the people that survived. There was an article in a magazine back from 1994 So, you know, you just kind of put all these little things together, and and that was a a horrible expedition. I would actually like to find some movie to watch, you know, that might be about that whole expedition. I think that would be nice if there is a movie out there. Well, that's a good question. Maybe back in the 1930s, they did an awful lot of historic-based flicks at that time. Have you written any books on this yet for your own family? Yes, I did. Back in 2007, I wrote a book, Seth Carver and His Descendants, but it's so outdated now. I have found out so much more since then. Um, yeah, that happens. Like do, <laughs> yeah, I'd like to do another book when I think that I can't go any further, when I think I'm <laughs> about discovered everything I'm going to. And we also have a DNA project going on. I love DNA. I'm really into the DNA yes. stuff. Yes, it's exciting. Well, keep going, Deborah. It sounds like you found quite a bit. You picked the right 10 years, by the way, to get started in, because everything's been happening in the last decade. Yes, and, you know, I just love it with now more and more records online. I mean, you still have to do footwork, but less of it. <laughs> less of it. Exactly right. She's Deborah Bruns from Montgomery, Illinois. Thanks so much for sharing your stories, and, and good luck with Grandpa. He sounds Thank like he was you. quite a handful. Yes, he was. Thank you. (laughs) And if you have a great story of discovery, just drop me a note on our Extreme Genes Facebook page, and you may find yourself on the show. And coming up next, he is our preservation authority, Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He's going to be talking about how to take better photographs because we're making family history every day. It's coming up in three minutes on Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show.
Extreme Genes is sponsored in part by 23andMe.com, a personalized genetic service that helps you understand what your 23 pairs of chromosomes, your DNA, say about you. 23andMe.com gives you a snapshot view of your DNA with more than 60 detailed reports on your health, traits, and ancestry, plus tools to explore and compare your DNA with family and friends. 23andMe.com is the first and only genetic service available directly to you that includes reports that meet FDA standards. Here's how it works. Order your DNA kit from 23andMe.com, provide your saliva sample from home, and mail it back to a CLIA certified lab. Then you'll be notified when your reports are ready online. You'll also receive ongoing reports as new genetic discoveries are made and as 23andMe.com is able to clear new reports through the FDA. See why more than 1 million people are experiencing their genetics with 23andMe.com. Order your DNA kit today at 23andMe.com. Well, Genies, my personal family history researcher who sends me new information day and night has sent me some incredible new records and newspaper stories lately. Hi, it's Fisher, and the name of that researcher, by the way, is MyHeritage.com. It's the hardest working service in genealogy, looking for records of your family 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Yes, even while you're sleeping. How does it work? MyHeritage uses hundreds of algorithms to match your ancestors to over 5 billion records from around the world. World, and with 97% accuracy. That means no more wasting time figuring out whether or not a match really is a match. I hear from listeners all the time who are shocked with how much information is accurately found and then passed along. And now my heritage will translate your ancestors' names into English or any other language you like from foreign records. In fact, it works with over 40 languages. No one else does this. Whether you're a beginner or seasoned researcher, you need MyHeritage.com. Here it comes, the 6th Annual Roots Tech Conference in Salt Lake City, Utah, February 3rd through 6th, 2016, at the Salt Palace Convention Center. The conference, hosted by Family Search International, is the largest family history and technology conference in the world. This year's theme will be celebrating families across generations. It's the perfect place to be inspired to discover, preserve and share family connections and stories across generations, past, present and future. At Roots Tech, you'll find some 200 engaging classes with experts from all over the world. Enjoy daily sessions with well-known keynote speakers and learn all about the new tools available to help you in your journey in the massive exhibition hall. Passes start at $29 for more information and to register visit rootstech.org. Hope to see you February 3rd through 6th in Salt Lake City, Utah. And welcome back to Extreme Genes, America's family history show on ExtremeGenes.com. It is Fisher here, your radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He's our preservation authority. Hello, Tom. Hello. Well, you know, we are making family history every day. And it's exactly. an interesting uh, email I got from one listener who was asking, wait a minute, if we're making history now, we want to make our images, our memories, our photographs look the best they can possibly be. And mine don't look that good. So she, she is looking for a little advice on what she can do to make modern-day photos look better right now. And I'm thinking mostly off the cell phone, right? Oh, exactly. That is such a super question. Because back in the day, when I was first into this industry, cameras were pretty expensive unless you had one of those little teeny brownies. And then developing the film was expensive. Now, you've got an iPhone already. You can take killer pictures with it or an Android or any of those. It's just amazing the quality. However... No matter how sharp and crisp your picture is, if your pictures aren't composed correctly, they're not going to look very good. They're going to be kind of unpleasing and sometimes uncomfortable to look at. And a lot of times people don't know why. They look at some photos and say, oh, that's such a beautiful photo. Why doesn't mine look like that? I've got this big, expensive Nikon. The thing is, it's nice to have nice camera equipment. However, that doesn't make you a good photographer. In fact, when I used to teach classes, I would have parents come in and say, oh, you know, I want to buy my kid this camcorder. And I go, well, before you go spend a couple grand on a nice camcorder, make sure they understand the basics, that they're doing good with the basic equipment, 
then go and invest in it because they could get tired of it, not want to continue on it. They could not learn the composition stuff they need. But now you can buy that same $2,000 camera for a couple hundred bucks. Right. So it's amazing what you can buy nowadays. And when you consider that most phones keep getting better and better, you see some of the ads that are on television right now and show the pictures that people have taken on a phone. It's astonishing. Things you couldn't have done on a multi-thousand dollar camera even 20, 30 years ago. Oh, that is absolutely so true. Like when I was in high school, I had a Nikon. And so I was taking pretty good pictures. But then when I had my teachers kind of teach me about composition, they look so much better. And now, like you say, these iPhones, in fact, this new iPhone 6S, the pictures it takes, yeah. you know, are crazy. In fact, I always said, oh, I'm never going to go to digital. I love my Nikon. Nothing's ever going to look like it. Well, that still is true. Film has a special look to it, which is wonderful. Right. But these new digital cameras are absolutely phenomenal. It's just incredible. Well, it's the realism of them that's so phenomenal now they will never fade let's, exactly let's start there you could make a print i suppose that fades at some point so what is some of the basic advice you'd give people in your classes about composition okay the best thing you want to do is do what i call a rule of thirds so if you take your viewfinder and split it up into like a tic-tac-toe grid the first line that's going horizontal is where you want their eyes to be And it's fine to cut off the top part of somebody's head or their hair, even into their forehead. Don't go below their eyebrows. It's especially important that you never cut off the bottom. Because if you see their jaw going in and out of the frame, you're going to be going, it just doesn't look natural. So you're talking video and photographs. Oh, exactly. Most of the composition will go for both of them. So like if if you have a still picture and their chin's cut off, it just doesn't look right, especially their chin and their top of their head's cut off. (laughs) Unless there's a special look that you're going for. Exactly, which you know, I don't know what that look is, but if that's what you're going for, you know, rock and roll. Well, if Grandpa has an ugly head or a really nasty chin, <laughs> it, it might be exactly what you're looking for. But that's why we have Photoshop. Yes, that's that's true. So what's another a great tip concerning photography? Okay, whenever somebody's kind of looking to one side or another, you want them looking into the empty space of the camera. Right. So if they're looking to the right, you want to make sure their head's on your viewfinder towards the left. So they're looking into the empty space. If they're looking right at the edge of the film or the camera, whatever you're shooting, it's going to look like they've ran into something. When you're watching somebody run or watching somebody move, you're moving with them and you're keeping a little bit of space in front of them so that they don't go out of the frame too much and you see the back of their head. Same thing in composition. You want to keep any of the what we call white space or open space in front of them. Just like you'd also keep the open space on the bottom if you're shooting a tight shot. Cut off their head's fine. Don't cut off their chin. Never, never. Mm. And whenever you're taking a picture, especially if you're doing kind of a a group picture, always look at the background before you look at your group. Because if you've got like a whole bunch of telephone poles behind them and you're shooting a real deep depth of field, these telephone poles and fence poles are going to be coming out of their heads or stop signs, and it's going to look really, really funky. So after the break, we'll go into a way that if you're into a situation where there are fences and there are telephone poles, how you can make them disappear. Interesting stuff. And we'll get into this more in three minutes on Extreme Genes. America's Family History Show. Looking for an easy way to show off your family history and share it with your family? Family Chart Masters offers beautiful custom pedigree art pieces and inexpensive family reunion draft charts in any design or size that fits your needs. With a free consultation at FamilyChartMasters.com, you can get started creating a new family masterpiece. Family Chart Masters has over 11 years of experience in creating and printing family charts. They can print any style genealogy chart from any genealogy file and can create exactly what you're looking for. You'll work with a specialized and talented consultant whose goal is to make you happy. Decorative charts make fantastic gifts for all occasions. And with Family Chart Master's option of ordering duplicate charts at half price along with your original purchase at full price, you can afford to give a family heirloom to each member of your family. Contact Family Chart Masters today at FamilyChartMasters.com for your free consultation. Family Chart Masters will give the greatest care to your family history. 
When was the last time you heard your grandmother's voice or saw your family enjoying life back in the 1950s or 60s? If the reason is you haven't known what to do with your old recordings, videos, and films, here's your answer. The Multimedia Center in Salt Lake City. We brought in a video project to the Multimedia Center, and overnight, they duplicated it to DVD so we could meet our deadline. The Multimedia Center, 2870 East, 3300 South, Salt Lake City. Open Monday through Friday, 10 to 6. Call 801-483-1717 or go to Transfer Duplication. Scientific studies have proven that youth who know even a little bit about their family history perform better academically and have a greater sense of personal confidence and stability. Genealogy is its own incredible superpower that arms our children with super strength. But how do you get your child or grandchild interested in studying their family history? That kind of stuff is just for grandmas, right? Not anymore. ZapTheGrandmaGap.com leaps the generation gap in a single bound. Author Janet Havorka provides you with useful and timely advice on helping the young people in your life become engaged in their own family history. Janet has an entire collection of books to inspire the young and the young at heart in fun, interactive ways. She also offers creative tips and advice on her blog and in her free weekly newsletter. Stop by ZapTheGrandmaGap.com today to sign up for Janet's free email newsletter with 52 weeks of easy tips, free downloads, and order your set of resource books and workbooks. We are back. Final segment of Extreme Genes, America's Family History Show and ExtremeGenes.com. Fisher here, the radio root sleuth with Tom Perry from TMCPlace.com. He's our preservation authority. We're talking about photography and composition because, you know, we're making family history every day. And we live in the now with modern equipment. And one thought I had, Tom, as you were going through some of the things concerning composition in the first segment is that you can learn a lot by watching movies. When you go to the movies, step back a little bit in your mind as far as the story is concerned and look at how they film people in terms of the spacing they give it, in terms of the rule of thirds like you talked about. In fact, one movie I love is Oh Brother, Where Art Thou with George Clooney. Watch it again and do exactly what you said. Just sit and look at the framing on it. Look at the colors, how they have the composition done. A lot of stuff was done in color correction. But just kind of look and see how they shot people running, how they shot people interacting, how they did extreme close-ups, and just kind of learn from it. You could actually turn the audio off just to see how they shoot the film. That's an excellent idea. That's really, really good. Because sometimes the audio kind of carries the video, and so you're not really so much into the video. But if you do that, if you totally turn off the audio, then you're really going to pick up things you never did before. The lighting, for instance. Exactly. The background, (laughs) the movement, all those things. And that all applies to how we shoot either photographs or videos. And one thing you'll notice when the audio is turned off is you'll notice mistakes because everybody (laughs) makes mistakes. Those are fun, though. (laughs) Oh, they are. They're hilarious. Some of the things you'll see are crazy. One thing that I really, really dislike about Hollywood is all the night scenes, the way they light them. It's always this perfect full moon. Everything's bright. There's no shadows. It's just so wonderful. And it drives me nuts because I've never seen a night really like that. Yeah. Because what they did, they would get these big balloons with lights in them and send them up in the air. So it just made this nice, soft look. Whenever there was night scenes in a road, you'll always notice that it just rained. The roads are always wet because they would always have a water truck go through and wet the road to make the good contrast of the black road. And you'll notice things like that where you thought, wow, I've watched this TV series or I've watched this movie and I've never noticed that stuff. It really opens your eye to catching a lot of those kind of things. You know, one thing I would suggest you do, go to the Boy Scouts of America website and download the photography manual, and it's free. It's a PDF, and it will give you a lot of good tips, and it's got a lot of good links to other things you can do where you can sit down and look at stuff which we don't have the time to get into, and radio isn't a very good visual format. And so look at these things, and they'll help you a lot. One of the biggest things you want to do, which we talked about in the first segment, if you can't move your people and there's stop signs, there's a chain link fence, move them as far away as you can and adjust your depth of field on your lens. Now, this is one problem you run into. With, so this is focus you're talking exactly. about. Exactly. Your depth of field tells you what's focus. Depth means how deep my picture is in focus. And you can do something where you have the tip of their nose in focus and their eyes are out of focus Mm. if you go a super, super small depth of field. This doesn't really work if you're using an Android or an iPhone. 
But if you're shooting with a Nikon or anything that has an adjustable lens and has what they call f-stops that around your lens and the shutter speed, you can adjust these things. So if you want a really small depth of field, you want to sit and play with your f-stops so the fences are blurry. Then they're not going to say, hey, you know, why is this stop sign coming out of Aunt Martha's head? Right. Because it looks really funky. It's very displeasing and she won't be thrilled at all with you. Well, and that's great advice, too, about the Scout thing, because it would be so fundamental because it's for kids. And it's also a great way to maybe teach your kids and grandkids how to have a lifetime of good experiences using their phones or their cameras. Absolutely. Just learning some basic stuff. I would rather have a cheap camcorder or a cheap camera and have some understandings of the basics than a big, expensive Nikon and not knowing what the heck I'm shooting. Great stuff, Tom. Thanks for coming on. Good to be here. I cannot believe we are done for another week. Thanks once again to Janet Havorka from FamilyChartmasters.com for coming on and talking about how we can share some of our information across various platforms to make sure other people can get it and we can make sure our stuff is preserved. Also to Deborah Bruns for talking about her journey and discovering her grandfather and his sordid past. We've had a lot of black sheep on the show lately. Thanks for joining us. We'll talk to you again next week. And remember, as far as everyone knows, we're a nice, normal family. Family.